What is up guys? This is All The Smoke on Strength of Physique with your hosts Adam and Chris, where we provide you with evidence-based information, community support, and recognition to all who are bettering themselves with fitness. Welcome back to All The Smoke podcast. We have a very, very special guest. Um, and as you guys all know, this is a pivotal moment in her career with our five listeners on All The Smoke podcast. <laughs> Um, Astrid, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our four listeners? Thank you for, so much for having me uh, to begin with. And yeah, well, I am basically from South America. So I did my bachelor's degree. Uh, I finished in 2012. Uh, I did my bachelor's degree for five years and a half. Then I did a little bit of my like private practice, education, uh, seminars, and a lot of different things, like uh, a, a young entrepreneur. And then I moved to Australia and I decided to do my master's degree for two and a half years. And in the meantime, I started my business uh, internationally as nutrition coach and um, and in the meantime, as well, once I de- finished my degree, my master's degree, I started straight away working as a part-time dietitian uh, in a clinical hospital um, with mental health and rehab patients. So I've been doing that for about three years, almost four years. And alongside that, I've been doing small little projects um, for like uh, as an education uh from the educational part of it um, as well as like growing uh, in the social media working a lot harder than I thought I would and I'm here so a little bit of everything I could speak a lot more about myself but I don't want to make it too long because I could be here for so many minutes of speaking about my background and why I did come to Australia, why uh, I have a strong accent and my Spanish then moved and started speaking English. And oh my God, it's just a long story. <laughs> so it actually, it's really interesting that you did a clinical background. That's not something I personally knew. Uh, what drew you to that clinical aspect well, when you do your bachelor's degree as a nutrition dietetics, it, it sort of puts you in a position that you, you pretty much don't have any choice rather than you get taught a lot on the clinical side of dietetics. So it is something that you don't really decide whether you like it or not. It's part of the, the nutrition degree. Uh, and, big, and that's why it takes longer than like two years or like it's almost six, six years, it's five years and a half. Um, it takes, you see, it's, our, it's like about 10 semesters and in every single of them, you see different things. So it takes a long time. You see physiology, biology, biochemistry, anatomy, uh, uh, human nutrition, you see clinical nutrition, you see the, the internships in the practice, you actually go into hospital, work with patients in different uh, wards, in different settings, uh, outpatient setting, inpatients. It's, it's like a whole new world when you get to see dietetics. Like when I decided to be a dietitian, I was so selfish. I just wanted to be, to know how to create and design a diet to lose weight. That, that was my only thought to that. That was it. Okay, if I study nutrition, I'm going to be able to design diets and lose weight. That's, that's awesome. And I didn't know that that was so profound. And it's pretty much like studying medicine, but obviously everything is about nutrition. So yeah, it's, it's cool. That's right. I think that's a really good, uh, a good point you made that a lot of people think like nutrition, that aspect, it's right. We just develop food, a food plan, and it should just lose weight. Um, but I think as you know now, um, there's so many more components or variables that got to go into it. Um, can you explain... Um, specifically with that mental health population, what are your type of avenues or routes that you would help them achieve with food relationships if that was something that you had to do? Do you mean mental health patients? Yeah, so the clinical population that you were speaking about or even the clinical popu- or the population you work with now, other than, hey, it's not like, it's not like here's macros, follow this. 
it's something yeah. I know that you're really big about is again, sustainable fat loss and the mindset about um, achieving those goals. Yeah. So because I have so many hats, I, I think when I put my hat of clinical dietitian, um, sometimes you have to be very prescriptive because there's no other way that you can go about it with patients that might not be as compliant or they have a specific condition that you need them to uh, be very, very wary uh, and very diligent on. So for example, patients that are already or over 65 years old, they need to, they need to be told what to do. Uh, most of the times, if you don't give them a specific directions or you're not very specific what you want from them, they are not going to be able to stick to the specific things or specific prescriptions, especially if it is coming from a request from family or from the doctor. Um, so you want them to be as adherent as possible. Whereas if you speak about someone who is like the mental health ward, because it's so, such a different population is we're talking about people that are relatively young, in their 40s, 50s, we get some people that are over 65, but most of the times we, we see people that are younger, they're mobile, they are not like uh, in their late period of their life. So, and they are also uh, experiencing lots of different complications with their mental health. So they are probably not in the best mindset to specifically dedicate to lose weight or like if you want them to do something, you need to um, understand what their priorities are and where is the, their head at that point in time. And sometimes they come to me and they want to lose weight and they ask me what, what they should be doing. And sometimes when I hear the stories, I realize I don't think this is a good idea right now. Your priorities should be uh, focusing on getting better and managing your anxiety, your depression, um, getting things stable first, because it's like the foundation is the mindset and how you feel. And if you if that's not right, you pretty much could start a diet today because you feel good, you feel confident, you feel motivated, and tomorrow is a bad day, you're in a low mood, and you're just going to throw everything out of the window. So it is not going to work if you dedicate um, or you have the mindset, okay, you want to do it, but it is, is it the right time? I don't think it is. So I, it is a lot of conversations around that and understanding what the priority is, uh, trying to give them a little bit more of awareness of the importance of nutrition and mental health and how important it is to be very well nourished and understand the importance of eating uh, a whole range of different food groups in their diet, especially because when we talk about patients that are depressed or anxious, we, we see these two extremes. We see patients that can go and overeat because this is the comfort foods. So if they are stress eater, emotional eaters, they're going to use food as a coping mechanism. Whereas if uh, there's another extreme that people that are very stressed, anxious, they won't eat. So they could probably don't eat for the whole day, but then there's a point that the body is like, I, am, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm so ravenously hungry that it just pushes you to uh, an irrational, I would say like a, an irrational attitude where well, you're not taking the like ownership of your thoughts or your decisions. And it's, kind of, it's like, you know what? I'm just going to eat whatever it is, whatever is the first thing I see. And generally something easy, convenient, quick and easy, and high, very, very high rich in calories. And it, they end up binging at night. And that's why then they're starting complaining of why they are gaining weight. You know? They blame the antidepressants, but this is, is a lot of different factors that has not nothing to do with the antidepressants by itself. So I don't know, it is a very deep, complicated conversation um, when it comes to mental health patients. And on the other hat that I have, especially with my clients in the mental health, um, in, in my coaching, like uh, when I am putting my anti-diet dietitian, um, uh, 
hat high umbrella <laughs> how many hat. hats do you have how many hats do you exactly hat. have <laughs> <laughs> so when I put my hat of the anti-diet dietitian I, and I work with my clients online, it is another story. It is like dedicating 100% of my time to understand the background, why they want to achieve the goals they are trying to achieve. Um, and most of the times they come with the obvious reasons that they want to improve the body composition, they want to lose weight. And I generally find in this type of clients that they are chronic dieters. They've been trying to do, they've tried every single diet in the planet. They have failed. They regained the weight. They put the back. They start another diet. And this is a vicious cycle of dieting all the time. So when I understand that that's the pattern there, it is constantly repeating in these different clients. Most of the times I... I sit down with them and tell them you need to stop dieting for a little while um, and learn behaviors that you need to utilize to improve your relationship with food in the first place. You need to have a better relationship with your body and have a better, uh, like a better end, uh, entry to a fat loss phase. You need to be more optimal to have a better and more optimal how would I say it? it's like a better awareness of your your bodily needs, your hunger levels, understand how you feel, what you need, rather than just wanting to follow a meal plan or being told what to do, because I'm not the one who's going to talk, tell you specifically what you need to do. I am going to negotiate with you. I'm going to offer you a range of tools that you can use, but I'm, you're, not, you're never going to hear from me. This is the macros. Follow them, and I see you in one in one month. See you later. So that's not being a coach. That's not you don't get anything out of it. That can be told by an online macro calculator. So when when I when I hear these things, the, there's an expectation of, of what are you going to prescribe me? Uh, what what should I be following right now? Um, give me the meal plan and like I don't give meal plans in the first place and secondly I really want you to work with me to change completely the game in the sense of whatever you've been doing so far hasn't been working right so you are not going to continue doing the same thing you're not going to go back on a calorie deficit if you've been on a calorie deficit already you've been eating like for six months or a year like 20 1200 calories or 1300 calories i actually going to make you eat more and let's get you in a reverse diet let's get you more optimal your metabolic uh your more metabolic rate to be more optimal too let's get you stronger let's push the gym let's get better more confident let's do all of these things learn how to embrace eating more because you deserve to eat more in the first place you don't have to be dieting all the time to be skinny you actually can do much better if you're eating more calories and you are training harder you're you have energy you're more consistent and you're not binging at night or being inconsistent over the weekends because you were so restrictive over the week that the weekends are a mess so for me, it's like lots of different things. And I, this, is, this is answering the question of why did I decided to be an RD and I think I extended too much. So I'll shut up for a while. No, I, abs I, I absolutely love that. Uh, I think it's very important to have all those different hats because it gives you whatever hat you decide to choose in the long run or focus on the most. You're going to have a very well round amount of information stored and all those hats in the closet that you can always go grab. Um, and I think you touched on something extremely important, figuring out actually what the client's all about. Yeah. The reason why they're coming to you is because they want to lose weight, change body composition, whatever way that's really important. And it, it seems very redundant at times because I'll always get clients and I'm consistently having to ask why, like they come, they're like, I want to gain muscle. And I'm like, okay, why do you want to do that? They're like, because I don't have a lot of muscle right now. I'm like, 
So like take away the thought of wanting muscle. What caused you to think that you wanted muscle? Was it a recent breakup? Was it you saw someone very attractive and they were with someone else that were huge? Uh, Usually there's a root cause that individuals, maybe their parents look down on them because they're not athletic, whatever the case is. Uh, it's very important to understand that. Why? Because then you can really relate to that individual and give them the help they need. If they need, uh, ultimately, if it's not really more muscles that they need, maybe they just want to like run a 5k really good. Okay. You don't need a lot of muscle to run a 5k. We can be good at the 5k with how you currently look. Let's focus on the training and just fuel, fuel your body appropriately for that. Um, so I think, all of those hats are really important. I absolutely loved listening to all of those. Uh, and you mentioned some things about like a reverse diet. Uh, what's your input on a reverse diet or recovery diet? How do you handle each of those? Or do you consider each of those different? And explain a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. So reverse diet and recovery diet, are two, they're kind of a similar approach, but they different in the sense that a recovery diet is more like acutely intense. Uh, It's like a a much more aggressive approach in the increase of calories. And it is usually utilized in someone who has a very strong metabolic adaptation from dieting. And we usually see this in competitors, physique competitors, uh, or people who has lost a lot, a lot of weight, and they are very in a very low body fat percentage. Um, so we see this in contest prep uh, physique athletes that generally they've they've lost quite a lot of weight, and they they get to a very low body fat percentage, um, and their physique physiological adaptations are very is strong and obvious at that point. So what you want to do once they compete is try to create this protocol of a recovery diet where you bring them back to maintenance, their actual maintenance. And in addition to that, you give them an additional four to th- 400 to 1,000 calories on top of it. So you put them in a surplus to make them weight, gain, make them gain weight at least 20% of what they lost uh, from their, their body weight competition. So it is, it is usually something that should be lasting about six weeks. So it's very aggressive, but it's something that it is generally utilized in someone who has uh, these metabolic adaptations quite, quite marked. Now, with the reverse dieting, it is something that you can utilize in competitors. Uh, especially for those who might be uh, in, in engaged in other competitions within the same year. So you don't want them to regain all the way back to cut and go back down. Uh, but generally, you can utilize reverse dieting with general population or like more normal non-athlete or physique, uh, physique athlete uh, populations. So... I think the way you do reverse dieting is that you want to aim for a slow increase of calories in a progressive way, very gentle. And it is something that you you try to um, work with the clients in a way that the, the client doesn't gain as much weight and minimal amount of body fat as possible uh, while trying to build up everything you can in terms of keep, keeping their, their training adequate. They, it is like a small or short lean bulk that you might use with this type of approach. And usually you can utilize the reverse diet for uh, someone who has been chronically dieting for a long time and you want them to get into a better place in terms of their metabolic health. Maybe they, they, have, they have been over training for a long time, under eating, they're chronically exhausted. They, you see an uh, ongoing and repeti- repetition of binge, binge eating, uh, chronic, chronic uh, fatigue. There's a lot of different things that come with it. So what you want to do with the reverse side is try to implement 
that gently, um, especially if you have someone who is scared to gain weight too fast. You want to use this as a strategy to use, you utilize that protocol, you increase calories slowly uh, every week. And in addition to that, or at least what I do with my clients is I try to start working around behaviors, habits, um, how you feel, how to build that relationship with food in the, at the same time you are eating more and realizing that you can have more energy, sleep better, uh, have the permission to eat more carbohydrates, uh, have carbohydrates at night because you feel like if you have carbohydrates after 6 p.m., you're going to gain weight. It's like breaking through all these myths and teaching them that they can eat more and this giving, giving them that power back that they have the control of, over the diet. They can be more intuitive. They can listen to their body and say and feel when they're hungry, when they are satisfied, uh, be more mindful. So practice a lot of these mindful uh, eating strategies. In the meantime, they're eating more and they're recovering um, and paying attention to their metabolic health. So I guess that's a big difference. Um, I generally work mostly with the reverse diet. Um, there has been very, very few opportunities that I had the need to implement a recovery diet. It is something that you just might use sporadically with certain athletes if you need to. Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, I think that's been a hot topic lately on social media, reverse for, and recovery. Um, and I think a lot of them think they're synonymous with each other, but I thought you did a really good job of um, breaking them down and showing that they're actually different. Um, and recovery shouldn't always just be, I think it's almost, I think something you mentioned is like the diet, dieting is important, but I think the diet after the diet is just as important, right? Because a lot of people, they've dieted and dieted, diet, they had no success. So let's go ahead and start that reverse implement all these habits um, and that will set you up for success in your fat loss phase. Um, is, could you go over some of the mindset shifts or some of the like, I know you touched on a little bit like, hey, you can have carbohydrates after 6 p.m. Could you go over of some of the other mental barriers you are trying to break or those myths that you're trying to break with all of your clients um, and letting them know, hey, this is why we need to not diet so you can kind of develop all of this? What are the um, type of avenues that you usually go with those clients? So I'll give you an example. I have, a, I have this client um, that she, she was dieting for, she's just been dieting. She thought that she had to diet for the rest of her life because she wanted to be physically more, more slim and look more toned. And she went, when we sat down and talk about her diet. She, she said that she was probably eating about 1300 calories and her, her calories were very low for a long period of time. But she said, but I feel like I'm struggling to follow it. And I am, I am finding that I'm not consistent as I should be. So I think there's no point to continue doing this diet because I am not achieving what I want to achieve because it's so low in calories that I feel like there's a lot of restriction. My relationship with food is, is damaged because I have all the time, I have this anxiety that I should be eating this and not this, and I should be avoiding certain foods. Uh, or when I go out, it is just that uh, idea that you can't have certain things or you won't be able to enjoy anything because you have to follow this, this restrictive uh, protocol. So. When I, when I realized where she was at, the first thing I told her was, what if we just take you to the best place you could be in terms of your maintenance calories? Probably we don't know yet what your maintenance calories might be because you've been chronically dieting for so long that what we can do to figure that out is to do a reverse. So let's just start from where you currently are, let's say 1300 calories, but I'm going to bump it up to 1500 and let's start there for a week and let's see what happens. In the meantime, I really want you to pay attention to the speed that you, that while you're eating, what's the speed you're eating? Focus on your hunger cues. Are you hungry? Are you, are you satisfied when you're eating? Um, I want you to pay attention to 
the quality of the food you're eating, um, the amount of protein. Are you eating enough protein in the first place? Um, maybe you're not even eating enough protein. Are you eating carbohydrates? Maybe you're not eating enough carbohydrates and that's why your training sucks. Oh, that's why you're overeating at night because you are so hungry, you didn't have enough food in, in the morning. Are you having breakfast? Uh, it's these little things that we see that uh, they, they, they seem to be hidden in the client's story. They don't tell you all these details, but when you start trying to understand all of these things, you realize that there is a lot of things that you need to understand and bring, the, bring them up to the client to realize everything they've been doing is just against what they should be doing to improve their, their body composition, their healthy, their health, their relationship with food. So it is trying to break every single thing and bring education, so educate the client and bring them the empowerment that they can change by understanding the evidence behind certain things. I remember when I, when I was younger and I had no idea that energy balance is sort of the king when you want to lose fat, I was so stressed about this is the stupid things like um, eating carbohydrates or after, after 8 p.m. or having a treat every now and then because uh, I thought there were bad foods that I just couldn't eat anymore in my life. And if I had them, I had physically, I was feeling physically that I was gaining fat. And that's the power of the placebo effects and, and, the, and believing that something is bad. It straight away, I was feeling that I had cellulite in my legs. So that, that's how I was so overwhelmed with that, um, that information that I was believing in. And when I understood, you know, you can be eating certain things to enjoy, but if you're, still, if you're still on a calorie deficit, you're going to lose fat. You're not going to gain weight. I'm like, where has this information been in all my life? I wish I would have known this since the fir very first day. Um, and I, it would have been so much easier. I wouldn't have had like, my, uh, like an eating disorder, bulimia. I, I, would, I had so much hard, hard work on that, on that period of time. So that's what I try to bring with, to my clients, education, awareness, and open this whole new world when they, have, they can experience food freedom and still achieve their, their, their goals. But the most important thing is I try to educate that this is not a race and they should not try to rush everything just because they want to look better. The only, the only time I would say you have to lose weight quickly is if you are suffering from being overweight, if your joints are hurting, if your back is uh, affecting your quality of life, like if your excess of weight or body fat is actually affecting your health, that's when I support like a rapid fat loss uh, phase or something that it is very specific um, and prescribed to improve the quality of, of, of life and improve health in general. But if there's not a strong reason, I generally go for the sustainable approach. So I can bring every single tool I have to make sure this client is going to succeed beyond losing the weight and maintain and keep it up for the rest of their lives. And I think, you know, the key word there is sustainable. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that because like you said, the chronic dieters, they eliminate so many things or they have that mindset that you keep it talking about as a, Hey, I can't have carbs. I can't have certain foods. This is a bad food. This is a good food. And when you start narrowing your lenses that much, it becomes unsustainable and unmaintainable and it becomes more of a, a stress than anything. And then I think that's why it's so, it just a spiral effect of negativity. Um, so I think, you know, what are ways that you try to make it sustainable? What are the way or the tools that you were talking about? What are ways that you're trying to educate those individuals that, hey, you can have carbohydrates. And like you said, the overall king is calories in versus calories out. Um, but as you've kind of described, there's so much more into that because we have these nutrition almost is a religion for some people. It's like, I'm not following this or if I'm not eating this, then I'm doing it completely wrong. 
what are the ways that you're trying to broaden that lens and allow them, hey, this is how we're going to make this sustainable. This is how we're going to do things so you can build these habits and not go back to your old habits and this, these extremes and, again, hate your life because you're only eating 1,200 calories because ice cream and cookies, they're amazing. Yeah, I think one of the most important things that I consider when I'm, um, I'm deciding that a client is going to go into a fat loss phase I think we're, we're talking about only clients that need to lose weight, right? Or, yeah. So when we're specifically talking about someone who comes to you and wants to lose body weight, change the body composition, the first thing I try to analyze is obviously where is where they're at right now in terms of body composition, understand what are the health implications, any medical condition that might be around their health that could be affecting their adherence or taking medic extra medications, um, the quality of life, the, their compliance, every single detail that might be affecting that aspect. Um, and also I try to understand what is the relationship with food right now? And what is what are some of the beliefs and What's the mindset around eating? What is the current knowledge to begin with when it comes to tracking macros or what has been their experiences with previous diets? What was successful? What was not successful? Um, what, made, what made them understand that they needed a change? Um, what, what, what has been some of the things that uh, they found they could have done better, but they didn't? Uh, and what were the challenges uh, or these barriers that were along the way that they couldn't overcome to achieve the goals. So once you have this, the whole picture of what is happening, you can, you can tell that the client might not be in the best position to lose weight. You might need to explain the client that they perhaps need to be in a reverse for a at least 12 weeks or eight weeks, at least as a small amount of time to, to see what, how much more calories they could eat and maintain their weight and body composition at that level before they even try to lower the calories even more. Because sometimes we don't even know what their true maintenance calories are. So we want to get there first before we actually implement any calorie deficit. Now, if the client, on the other hand, is pretty good in a pretty good position they are pretty much ready to go they want to compete in a i don't know in a they have to they want to do the contest prep for a, a physique um contest then we do what then we try to do a, like a more narrow-minded very specific approach to get them to the level they need to get for that competition so again is it sustainable? Is it optimal? No. So their objectives are completely different because you calculate you, your, current, your current body composition, body fat is 25% and you need to be at 12%. So how much time do we have to get you to from this amount of uh, body fat to 12%? So perhaps when we do the calculations, you probably have 20 weeks, 16 weeks, how much time do we have? And from there, if you have a lot of time, you probably can make it more sustainable because the, uh, the amount of calorie deficit can be much more gentle. But if you have a very narrow window where you have to work to cut as much uh, body fat as possible in a short period of time, you have to be aggressive and that's not sustainable. So if you have a client who has who's not competing in anything, they just want to lose weight um, and you're not really paying attention to how, much, how many time, how many months we, do we have to lose the weight. I just sort of take it uh, like small goals at a time. So for example, if they are 100 kilos and they want to weigh 70 kilos at some point, I don't tell them, well, we're, uh, our first month, we need to lose eight kilos. So I don't tell them that kind of things. I pretty much tell them, let's aim for 
our first five kilos. Let's see when that happens, but let's focus on something gentle. If we wanted to lose five kilos, this is the amount of calorie deficit we should be aiming for to achieve that, um, that new weight. Let's see, we can, we can calculate and do all the calculations to achieve the first goal. That would be five kilos less, the first five kilos. Um, but at the end of the day, once you start implementing this into practice, you need to see how the client feels. What is the, how consistent they can be with that? Uh, whether you need to be more strategic uh, in terms of implementing more like a cycle of calories. Some days they can be a little bit lower and some days it can be higher so they can do more socialize, so socializing. Um, they can go out on the weekends with the family. So it's more like a dis dis cycling of calories to strategically accommodate for the client lifestyle. But on the, any, any other other points, I sort of go week by week and just say, well, um, if your current maintenance calories are 2000 calories, let's drop 25% and see how it goes. See how much are you losing in terms of body, body, body weight, in terms of uh, like the rate of body fat loss. And if you're losing 0.5% of your body weight per week, that sounds like reasonable. Is, is a good rate. We can you keep going with that deficit. If you're losing too much, we need to slow down a bit. So maybe we increase the calories slowly for a little bit more. So the rate of fat loss is a little bit slower. And if there's no weight loss whatsoever, I always try to analyze why it is not happening. And sometimes it's not like the, the calculations were wrong. Sometimes if we're, if we're talking with a client that's a woman, there's a woman probably we're looking at menstrual cycle. Uh, so is it perhaps not necessarily that you're not in a calorie deficit? Maybe you're in a calorie deficit, but you're retaining body water. So maybe that's what is hindering uh, or sort of um, hiding the real progress. So let's wait for a little bit more if there's no real weight loss happening. At least one more week to see whether we need to actually change anything. But in the meantime, you are as consistent as you can be. Do what, as, whatever you need to do. Ma maintain your calories as much as you can. Um, keep your protein high. Uh, keep your steps uh, at, at a certain level. It's continue your resistance training. Uh, pay attention to your sleep, hydration, lots of different things. Be mindful of when you're sitting down, manage your cravings, all of these things. And then once we get there and see whether it is changing the way it's changing or not, then we adjust. So I, I hope it makes sense with these different scenarios. No, it makes perfect sense. I just wanted to ask you uh, a follow up on that. So, right, let's say an individual, right, they're doing everything to the T but that scale won't budge. Um, even if, let's say for a female, for example, it isn't their menstrual cycle um, or for a male, it's just that, again, they're doing everything. What is your, I guess, your approach to that conversation? Like, hey, um, sure, the scale is not moving, but you're doing X, Y, and Z. You're still seeing progress elsewhere. Are you kind of taking that approach or are you just kind of saying, okay, your goal is that number. Let's go ahead and slash more calories. What, are, what is your approach for either one of those? I think it depends on the client, um, how the, the client comes to you and feels about it. I have clients that they are so distressed because they not losing, they not losing weight or they not seeing progress that they are willing to do whatever, uh, and they start putting pressure on you that if they are not seeing results in one or two weeks, they're going to quit because that's the end of the world. And that puts pressure on you as a coach because your methods probably a little bit different and you want them to understand that it, the, you're, you don't have to be rushing about it, that you are trying to build up other things around that weight loss that is not just the weight loss, but you want to build confidence. You want to, you want to build that mindset that other things are important as well when you're trying to lose weight. What are your non-weight related victories? Where, how is your strength? Uh, how is your your mindset or, or like how you felt over the weekend when you went out? Do you feel like 
you were feeling anxious or now you felt free because you now are not longer stressed about what you're going to eat when you go out or you just choosing the things that you want and not feeling guilty about it. You don't see these things, but, but they represent meaningful changes that they have to pay attention to and realize that it is a lot, a much more meaningful progress that is going to be more lasting than just the weight they're losing. So it, it, I think it, it is a difficult question because it is hard to, to say depending on how the client responds to you, but there are clients that you can just tell them, okay, let's do something smart. If you're currently reversing, let's do one more week of reverse, at least to see what happens. And then from there, we're going to do a, a five weeks six weeks of a calorie deficit. And we're going to be very, very strict about it. We're going to go all in, very short, short, and then get out and see what happens. So that could be like a mini cut. Um, and that's more to make the client happy, but you know that whatever you're doing is going to, it's not going to affect their metabolic health because it's a very short period of time. So it allows you to play a little bit with the time and the, your client happiness and confidence. On the other hand, sometimes you could have or take the approach of, all right, let's take 5% of your current calories. So let's add a little bit of a smaller deficit on top of your current deficit and try to be as consistent as possible to see what happens. Sometimes what the client needs is to sleep more because they're not sleeping well. They are not really, they could be doing everything right, but they stress, they are not sleeping well, their mood is slow. So there are other signs of metabolic adaptation that doesn't necessarily need to do with being consistent or really uh, being tracking everything at the, at the dot. Perhaps they're moving less and they don't really realize that that's happening. They just is moving slower, doing less. Their needs is going down. Maybe they're they not reporting every every single thing they are eating, and that could potentially could be unconscious. They are probably not trying to do it intentionally, but it's something that they oh they just were they track something, but they just had something else that they just grabbed and they didn't track it. So it could be endless factors that could be interacting with the person not losing uh, weight or getting stuck, but you can definitely try to utilize different strategies depending on where the client is. I think that's really important too, um, that the, the client is really going to be the ultimate decision on how you end up responding to that. Um, something we keep mentioning though, is tracking, uh, tracking your food as in the macros. If someone doesn't know what the main macros are, it's going to be the carbs, fats, and proteins. We've been tossing those three words out there. Do you though, personally, uh, ever help someone through these processes without, uh, doing tracking? Uh, I obviously it's possible. It might be more difficult. And for someone that's probably doing a contest prep. Okay. You probably need to prepare yourself to be tracking for a decent amount of time. Definitely the 20 week period, if that's your, your cut, your time frame, you need to cut. Uh, but what approaches or what individuals do you see yourself not tracking with or trying to take a different approach and what approach do you take with those clients? So generally I try to understand whether they are happy to track and if they do we can take that route of being of using tracking as a as our first method so we can pretty much have everything objectively measured and we can track better the progress when it comes to needing any adjustments it's always better to have where to 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 go to and well, what we need to adjust, maybe we need just to up the protein a little bit more and adjust the carbohydrate and fat ratio. Maybe we just need to reduce the calories slightly and see what happens. Or maybe we need to increase the calories. And if I am doing a reverse diet, 
I need the client to be tracking so we can do this right. Now, if the client is completely against tracking because they have a very unhealthy relationship with food um, or just simply because they are very busy people or they are not willing to put more stress into their lives, um, I am all for giving them a structure they can follow or making a meal plan that is going to solve uh, or work with the client for a short period of time. But the way I try to teach or utilize these meal plans is based on um, something that I call the food choice system, which is basically teaching them the food groups and what a serve of each food groups represent in terms of calories, um, how much grams of carbohydrates a serve of carbohydrate will have. So they can refer, the, they know how many, how many serves per day they have of each food group. And they just refer to a list of exchange, uh, exchange lists where each food group has like 20, 30 different options within the same group and that you can choose from and basically alternate them and utilize as you will. So it is a, it is a method that is very simple that allows them or takes the pressure, the pressure out of counting or tracking macros every single time. And it's still something that they can utilize to learn about their, their, their food. So it's still a tool that they are learning something from, they understanding how much grams of carbohydrates protein has one serve um, and how to measure it because they need to learn how to measure and look at their portion size. So it's very, it, it is very good that I, that you can utilize this technique for someone who doesn't want to, to track specifically, or they want to transition from um, tracking to something a little bit less, um, a little bit, a little bit different from tracking. Okay. So it, that's something that I generally use that I can teach my clients to do. Apart from that, I can give, just give them a structure. So obviously we know that the weight is going to dictate whether you're in a calorie deficit. If you're not losing weight, you're not in a calorie deficit. So that's one of the first thing we need to see or we can track if you're not necessarily tracking macros, but you can track your body composition and your weight as an objective measure of any sort of physical progress. And you can just uh, start from what they're currently eating. And if whatever they're eating at the moment is maintenance that you can calculate from doing a food, uh, a food diary or food recall, and you as a coach calculate the calories and the macronutrients they're eating, you could basically understand, well, if you're not losing weight at this point, this is your calorie maintenance. So we just need to cut some portion sizes out. So maybe if you're eating two slices of bread for breakfast, let's eat one and see what happens from there. Uh, at lunch, let's do a small adjustment. Maybe you were having, I don't know, adding oil to uh, olive oil to your salad. Maybe instead of adding olive oil, let's not add any oil and see what happens. So we're cutting a small, a small portion sizes uh, without necessarily telling them that they have to aim for a specific uh, targets. Um, and you can still see with these small changes, good progress and uh, adjust from there. So, but it's just a little bit more difficult because there's gonna be a point that you don't really know how to, you have to be very objective and try to dig in very, very deeper. If you want to see if the, the client is not losing weight at all, what you need to do to change it around so they can continue losing weight without tracking. So it's a little bit trickier. You can give them more structure. So let's say you're gonna eat three meals to snacks. This is the, the plate you should look like. Half of the half of, of your plate should be vegetables, a quarter protein, a quarter uh, carbohydrate. And this should be three meals a day. See how it goes. If we need to change something, Let's change the portion sizes and see how it goes. So it is a, a very long answer. I'm sorry, uh, but yeah, it's trying to sort of cover every single angle of this answer. 
No, no, that's a really good answer. And it actually brings up another question I might have, or I do have, I, and not might. <laughs> um, so you mentioned like a point system or like uh, when you're not tracking, taking it from a list. Is that sort of, I don't know a lot about Weight Watchers, but I know they do a point system as well. Is that sort of the same concept? No, no, it's completely different because it's not like assigning points. It's like, if I tell you exactly how it goes is you as a coach have uh, a spreadsheet where you calculate exactly the calorie requirements and what's the the total calories once you decide what the deficit is. So let's say after you calculated the calorie deficit, the client is going to have 1,800 calories. So these 1,800 calories uh, are going to be comprised by a a protein target, carbohydrate targets, um, and fat targets. And basically what you do is assigning specific food groups. So you have, like when you look at the food pyramid, or like the dietary guidelines, we see there are food groups, right? So the food groups are associated with um, a common a common thing they have uh, in each food group. For example, when we look at protein sources like meat, chicken, poultry, fish, there's the common denominator there is the protein, right? So there will be they, they, this, that's going to be a specific food group for the protein sources. Then we have milk and milk and substitutes that is going to be um, milk and yogurt and like non-dairy, not dairy, non not real milk substitutes. Um, and then that's just going to be another group. So basically what you're saying is there are six food groups where they are, they are categorized according to the main components of macronutrient distribution. So you have the vegetables that are going to be primarily vegetables. So they have around in average because they all these groups are based on average. Um, you have the, the the vegetables are going to be around five grams of carbohydrates, two grams of fiber, twenty five calories. Um, in average, the food group of Fruit, for example, is going to be 60 calories, 15 grams of carbohydrates, no protein, um, and no fats. So you start to see that it makes sense to have them grouped in this this way, just to identify what is the predominant macronutrient and how what they have in common. So they just grouped in that way to make it easier um, to distribute as well as to manage your macronutrients when you're deciding what food groups are going to be allocated. And once you you know that, you you pretty much extract, well, how much protein do I have? And with the spreadsheet, basically, it calculates everything out to basically give you a number of portions that you can have or serve that you can have of each food group. And you can distribute that as you wish it during the day, but you try to make it more balanced. So you can have in one meal, you could have one serve um, of vegetables, for example, that represents a cup of spinach, for example. Um, one, uh, two serves of, I don't know, two serves of, of carbohydrates. That is about, like if we think about pasta, it is about a cup of pasta. So one serve is a half a cup, two serves would be a cup if you wanted to double that, to double that, the, the same serve. Um, and then you have three serves of protein, which one serve is about 30 grams. If you have three serves, you can eat 90 grams of chicken breast. So then you put that together and you have a, a dish or a plate where you have your, your vegetables, your protein and your carbohydrates. So does that make sense? It's not like a point system that I'm telling you, if you eat this, you have five points, but if you eat this other thing, you have two points. So it doesn't work like that. It's more like teaching you specifically the nutrients that certain food have in a much simpler way that doesn't require yourself being counting or tracking every single time. I think that's an excellent explanation. Thank you.
Yeah, I think that was great. And I think that's something that over time, when you track, you intuitively start having that. Um, and I think that's yeah. why, in my opinion, tracking is such a valuable tool. Um, and like you just did there, Ash, it's a weird skill, a weird talent. You're able to just kind of ramble off, hey, a, a serving is this, is this grams of carbs, proteins, and fats. Um, some people look at you like, hold up, how the hell do you know that? Be like, hey, I've been doing this for I don't know how long, but it's something that, right, I've done for that long, I've tracked for this long, and now once I need to step away from a diet, I can do that and not eat like an a-hole. Um, so that's why I try to under, I try to t- come to the approach where, hey, tracking is a, a valuable tool, and I think it will set you up for long-term success um, it, going into a dieting phase or when you go on vacation that, hey, you know self-consciously what's in that food, and you can kind of make that choice by yourself. Um, but I like how you're able to kind of break it down like, hey, you have this many servings of X, Y, Z. Um, now kind of just build that plate off of it. It's a nice little visual um, that you kind of do with the opposite direction. Um, I, so one thing that I kind of want to get your opinion on, um, Jackson Payos, he just came out with his paper on um, diet breaks and uh, things of that nature. Um, and Dr. Bill Campbell, the lab that Chris and I are involved in, we just, I think uh, our first semester, we had uh, just wrapped up our first um, refeed um, diet or study. And what are your approach on that? Because it seems like the, the evidence, the evidence of the research is showing that there's really no physiological benefit from it. I mean, sometimes um, Jackson Payos's paper was there's not even a psychological benefit from it. Um, is that something that you utilize? And if it is, why do you use it? I think the diet breaks uh, and the refits are a tool like any other thing that uh, any other strategy you utilize to increase adherence into a fat loss phase or just make your clients uh, practice maintenance for a while, especially if, we, if you're trying to teach something that is sustainable uh, for a longer period of time, getting a client from a fat loss phase that they are in a loan deficit and teaching them, well, now let's practice one maintenance for a week. And see how it looks like, how it feels, how you manage, how you, how are your habits that you've been learning actually play out when we're eating more calories. And sometimes I see it that way as a practice maintenance in within your fat loss phase. So obviously there are clients that don't need to do it because they probably don't don't necessarily have the all these signs that require to bring them or get, get, getting them out of the deficit just for the sake of upping the calories with no reason. And I think it is a very individual, uh, individual approach that you need to see, well, how is your hunger, energy, cravings, mood, sleep? Are these things really telling you that you may need a break? Maybe it's just a physiolog- psychological break. Maybe you just need to uh, stop dieting for a little bit. And that's going to make you train better, relax, sleep, socialize, go for a, I don't know, if you have a trip, you have a holiday, you can have a little bit of extra room with calories to play with. Now, is there something that you're going to benefit all the time? Not necessarily. And there are pros and cons as every single tool you use uh, that, will, that will report back to whether the client is going to actually find benefits out of it. So if the client is, has a lot of weight to lose, maybe they're, they don't even need a refeed or a diet break because physiologically and psychologically, they might, they might not be there in a position that they might need that. But if you have someone who has been dieting for a very long time or is very lean and they want to still continue to lose fat, it is a little bit trickier because they are at higher risk of le- losing lean body mass. So there are certain benefits of having diet breaks if you are going to, if they're going to allow you to train harder and be more adherent to, to your diet and ju- or even just getting a little bit of a mental break. So that's what I see these diet breaks and refits playing out. I don't think they're necessarily effective in terms of physiological benefits. Like you see that there are previous studies reported leptin going up and helping managing certain hormones in your body 
but because it's so a, such a short term effect, you once you finish the diet break or the refeed and you go back to the deficit, all the hormones fall back again to to the baseline they were previously. So the effect is not really um, something that you see on the longer term or you see it constantly rising until, unless you stop completely dieting and you're starting to getting into a reverse dieting or into maintenance phase for a longer period of time. Hopefully that makes some sense. No, I think that made perfect sense. And I think, um, right, as claiming to be an evidence-based coach, um, some people will just look at that one or two studies and be like, hold on, they don't do anything? Well, I'm going to not do it anymore. But like you said, there's so many components and variables to manipulating nutrition and training and all the other social aspects that go into somebody's life that I think refeeds and diet breaks are definitely a great tool. So somebody can, again, be more adherent. It can be sustainable, maintainable for their lifestyle. Um, and like you said, being in a deficit, you can still have that great relationship with food by implementing those tools. Um, but yeah, I thought it was it was strange that um, in the paper, they didn't kind of like mention any of that. They were just like, hey, there's no there's no differences. Like, why do we even do this? Why do we do this? I was like, there's there's plenty of reasons why you should implement things um, of that nature, even if it's not physiological, like psychological, I think uh, almost predominates uh, the physiological aspects, um, especially with training and nutrition. So um, I thought that was great. Um, Chris, do you have anything else for her? I just you touched on one hormone leptin. Uh and that'll probably be our last question just to wrap it up. When you are dieting leptin, that's going to help you control uh, your hungers, uh, not control, but it's going to make your body want to stay what it normally is. Because if your leptin is going up, it's going to make you more hungrier. You're going to have these cravings. Your, your body doesn't want to go away from what it's happy with. What are some ways that you, as a coach, help manage those cravings during those periods or if they're just cravings in general as well? So if, we, if we're referring specifically to leptin, leptin is going to be more like the satiety hormone that is going to determine whether even if you eat uh, plenty of food, you're actually satisfied and you're, you can you, it, like satis being satisfied you can be very full, but you can still feel like you're hungry, that you're, you haven't eaten anything. So that's, the whole, that's the, what leptin does. And this is completely correlated to uh, the, uh, the body fat levels. So when you lose body fat, because it's a hormone producing your adipose tissue, it is going to drop, obviously. So what happens with this hormone is that it also seems to be associated with your BMR or your basal metabolic rate. and the quality of of the or the capacity to retain lean body mass so it is it is more complex than just appetite but when it comes to just manage or just getting away from the hormones and just think about how do i manage my cravings there are a couple of things that you can always do and that's that's going to be making sure you're hitting an adequate amount of protein on a daily basis. So no less than 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight is the what's been shown to be the minimum target that is going to allow you to um, get the benefits of the protein and satiety. On the other hand, you really want to make sure you are exercising because exercise by itself seems to be an, uh, have an effect of appetite suppressant. Um, make sure you are well hydrated as well, because sometimes not being very well hydrated might increase some, some, so, like it might, it might increase your appetite or your hunger levels. Not every time. And it's not something that is, it seem, it is seen in every single person. But if you see the general average, like if you pay attention to all of these different things, that can really help you to manage better the cravings and understand whether you're really hungry or you just wanting to eat something because you are, you're not having these foods in your diet anymore. So that's my other point. Make sure that you are still allowing yourself to have certain things you do enjoy and like within your calorie deficit, uh, whether that's once a week, twice a week, or even like, is it, whether it's just one square 
of chocolate every single night if that makes you happy and still within your calorie budget that's going to be perfectly fine but that's going to allow you to manage that craving or that sweet tooth um, utilizing diet sodas if you're having like that craving for sweet um, or even artificial sweeteners and make things sweet if you're a sweet tooth um, or even like increasing the volume of your food by increasing more uh, a higher volume from vegetables vegetable intake and i guess it is trying to pay attention to all these details and make them as optimal as, pos as possible and with that it takes time it takes a lot a lot of time like you said we live in a world that is instant gratification if, if it seems like if we don't get those results in two weeks it's like man, this is stupid. I shouldn't be doing this. But something I try to uh, explain to my clients is say, hey, it took you how many years to finally reach out to a coach? It's not going to be where I'm going to be a superhero and be able to change everything overnight. Um, so again, it's going to take time and it's going to take some patience throughout that process to break these old habits, break these old mindset um, roadblocks that you kind of set up and built over the years. So um, it takes time to kind of learn what works for you. Um, but I think definitely having a coach, um, will help you, you know, shed light to that, that, that tunnel, um, and that, that darkness that you've kind of built in within. So, um, I thought this was a great conversation. You put out a lot of great information and tools and, um, for some people our four listeners, the first, if for some reason, if they don't know where to find you, um, could you tell everyone your website, Instagram, YouTube, whatever it may be? Well, Better to find me in Instagram is where I'm the active, I'm more active. Uh, so it's anti diet dietitian. Um, you can find me in my YouTube channel as a street dietitian. I don't know. I don't really know, but maybe my name and my and my dietitian. You might find me. Yeah, there's a picture there that is my face. You find me. Um, and I have my website that I just recently redeveloped uh that is a street a street dietitian a street dietitian .com, and you might find me there as well so yeah gotcha well thank you so much for taking your time um and speaking all and blowing all the smoke because a, a lot of people need to understand a lot of this and it's it's always cool to hear from a dietitian that takes this different approach because I think a lot of people, the stigmas and for a dietitian, it's here's a meal plan, follow, I should be successful, but there's so many more avenues and variables that you kind of have to control for. So I appreciate you bringing that into light. And Chris, you got anything else, sir? No, I just want to say thank you a ton. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for your time and giving some wonderful insights. Uh, I think Adam nailed the, or hit the head, nail right on the head with the whole, uh, most people think, dietitians are like, you need to eat this, this, and this, which obviously one of your hats is to do that. But also for someone that's just trying to go day to day with the normal, they don't have any restrictions that they can't, they can just eat whatever. Um, I think it's really important to take the approach that you do. And I love that uh, about yourself. So thank you a ton. This was all the smoke on anti-diets with the anti-diet dietitian. Herself. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. You have a wonderful or no, it's bedtime for you now. Yeah, it's bedtime. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good night, Adam. Good morning. Yes. And we are out.